I'm Robin Crane, and this is the Growing Your Financial Business, The Woman's Way podcast. Listen, I was a financial advisor for over a decade, and I got so sick of the old archaic strategies that your grandpa used to get clients. What the industry teaches today is still so outdated and just doesn't work anymore. So I had to find a better way for myself, and then I got obsessed with sharing these how-tos with other women like me. The stuff I teach doesn't require giving up your life, your sanity, or your family time. I want women like you to have it easier than I had it, so you can thrive in the industry. I've now helped thousands of women grow their financial businesses to multiple six figures, some even seven figures per year. So on this podcast, you're going to get an inside look at how they did it so you can do it too. Let's dive into the show. Hey, welcome back. We are here with Renee Bauer, and this is exciting because she's about to sell her practice. Now, she is not a financial advisor, but she is a divorce attorney, and she's been gearing up to sell the practice, and she's done a lot of things right with the business. And so we want to talk a little about how to create a scalable and sellable business. So before we dive into that, Renee, tell us even how you got into that world. I'm sure you went to law school, but other than that, maybe the path. And I know um, we'll delve into a little bit of the branding stuff as well, because I know you did things differently. And that's what a lot of the, the people who come to this podcast, like they want to do it differently. They don't want to, and they want to make sure they're aligned with it and not doing, you know, dumb, dumb videos. Like you said, before we started recording, like TikTok things like that, they're not aligned with. So we'll get into that as well. But I think with the focus really about creating a scalable and sellable business, especially as someone who starts as more like a solopreneur. So tell us about your background first. So I, um, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. Like I, I think like so many entrepreneurs who started when they were like kids with the lemonade stand. And I was, um, I lived next door to a neighbor who uh, taught swim lessons. So one day I printed out babysitter flyers and stood at the end of the driveway as all the kids left to her house and handed them out and started a babysitting business that way. And then got my friends to cover all the jobs I couldn't do and would, would take a little, a little piece of a like a commission on it. <laughs> nice. So that I've is been good. An, I've been an entrepreneur forever, but when I went to law school and opened, I didn't open my own practice immediately, but I did within the first five years. Um, the first thing I did was I looked at it as, okay, what can I do to make it stand out? My practice was on a street where it was called like lawyer row because there were so many of them. And it was, what was this in, uh, when was it? Where was it? Oh, in Hamden, Connecticut. Okay. And it was at the time where most lawyers didn't have websites. So I was like, all right, let me figure out what's happening for in the marketing world. Cause I always loved that, even though I never went to school for marketing. And I approached this business of what do, how do I want to make it look different? And like, just from the most basic, if you Google any lawyer's website and you pull it up, I guarantee you, you will click on a lawyer's website that has them standing in front of a bookshelf of all of their like law books from 1960. Like, that's what you see. So I'm like, well, let's change that up. Let's change up the messaging. Let's change up the, you know, talk about pain points. And that's how I always approached my law practice. And we went from, you know, I was uh, working on a folding table um, and grew it to the point where I'm now exiting it. And that's, uh, it'll be about 17 years from start to exit. Wow. Cool. Well, first I just have to mention that I was that person who had the swim business. So I was the one with like the swim lessons and I'd be like, yo, you poaching my clients. Like I would have taken a piece of your babysitting business. And then you would have taken a piece of the babysitters who were under you. But, um, I started as I, I got, um, you know, my, what is it called? I don't know. got, became an instructor as a swimming instructor. And then I was like, it doesn't make sense to go to some swim swim club where they're going to charge $25 a half an hour and make $12 an hour, even though I was only 16. And so, um, my parents had a pool. And so I started actually at first, I just started going to people's homes and started doing swim lessons for like eight bucks a half hour, which at 16, 17 was still pretty phenomenal because, you know, I was like, okay, well, instead of making $12 an hour now I make 16, you know, and I was like, I was pretty young. And then I started doing it from my home. And I kept increasing my prices and I was doing like $25 a half hour lesson eventually. And I'd like, you know, before I was 20, I probably had a $10,000 summer. You know, I was like rolling in it for a kid. Robin, we could have teamed up and had quite a business Seriously. going. <laughs> Seriously. I know it sounds, and it's so funny. Cause like, I never thought I was that entrepreneurial. Like I didn't think of myself as entrepreneurial. I just thought like, 
I didn't like the fairness of like, if I'm going to do all the work, I'm not giving it to the man, you know, and go and And I happened to be really lucky because I rode on the coattails of my mom because she was a pre-kindergarten teacher. So she was like my pimp, you know, sounds horrible, but like, you know what I mean? But she, you know, she'd had four-year-olds. It was like prime age in California for swim lessons. And she's like, oh, my daughter teaches swim lessons. And I'd get all these referrals. I didn't give her a cut, nor did I pay to rent my parents' um, pool, but uh, it was a pretty, pretty sweet deal. So um, I, I love that because it just reminds me of like, oh, wow, I guess, you know, we did think a little bit differently because not everybody thinks that way and thinks like some people think it's just normal, go work for a job and like you get what you get and you don't get upset. Right. I was also imagining when you told me like about the websites, I think that's very, very similar to financial advisors. Like if I go even now to websites, financial advisors, they might not be standing in front of, you know, a bookshelf, but it's actually hard to find a photo oftentimes uh, on a financial advisor's website, which I think is so crazy because I'm like, I want on the first page, the home page to know who you are. I'm more I'm more concerned with the, to make sure, you know, who I am. You mentioned pain points, you know, I want to make sure you understand my pain, understand what I want more than I want to know you. But then like the next thing is like, well, shoot, I want to see a photo. I want to watch a one minute video to make sure I like you because the whole no like and trust factor. And still to this day, so few financial advisors are doing that, whatever that cookie cutter website is, that's already pre-approved and that really sucks is like what most people go for because it's the easy path. Like, it's like, Oh, it's good enough. And they're just looking like you're going to that. Like what I talk about a lot is like the 3% who are looking for an advisor. That's what all websites, financial advisors mostly are talking to that 3%. They're already looking if they happen to land there, they're already looking. So like, you don't have to impress them. But what you did was very different. And I think that's what, you know, we're trying to send the message to financial advisors, like the importance of standing out and looking different and so that you can attract the right people. So let me ask you going back to like, you know, your business and, and, and the brand, cause you mentioned that, you know, it sounds like at first you took a different approach. Like you had to understand their pain points, you understand what they wanted. You talk to the person, get really clear. But then you mentioned before we started recording that in order to actually sell it, you had to actually take your name off the door. So tell me a little about that process and, and the juggling act between your personal brand, but then not being the business where you can never sell it because people only want you and you only. So it's, um, it, it's so interesting because for a really long time, my name, it was before it's before I took my name off and I completely rebranded it. I didn't actually think I did that knowing that I wanted to sell it. I thought I was doing it because it stood out. It was always borrow law group, right? Like what, what's the name of every other law office out there? Right. Sounds very similar. Last name, that, comma. Yeah. And, and that was something that I, I sort of kept to in the traditional mold. And then I thought to myself, I had this epiphany. I'm like, you know what? Everything else about our website feels different, looks different, has different messaging, except for the name. And I had already launched a podcast called Happy Even After, and I thought to myself, why wouldn't I name the law firm that? And it's funny because it got met with like people either said they loved it. They thought it was brilliant. Or I had some old timers say laugh and be like, what kind of name is that? And I'm like, well, you're still, you know, working on your little in your little office with your one part time employee. And we can't keep you know, we don't have enough people to answer the phones because they don't stop ringing. So something's working. <laughs> and and then I realized, and I was still actively practicing at the time, but I also realized that when that happened, when once I took my name off of it, I, there started to be less requests for me. So there were still referrals that came in and because of the history and as long as I've been practicing that that, that would happen. But often we would have people call and say they automatically wanted the the founder, the managing attorney, the main person. And so they would want me, but I didn't have a relationship with them. I didn't know them. They were just asking because they thought that if my name was on it, then I must know something. Mm -hmm. And when I took my name off and I stuck myself in the website with, with everything and didn't make myself stand out in any way, those calls stopped coming in. Mm -hmm. And then I thought to myself, well, what would happen just for a season? What would happen if I actually stopped taking clients myself? And I let my associates do it. And I had this moment of panic because it was like, well, wait a second, I'm the rainmaker. Like if that happens, how, how are we going to grow when people are going to not hire us? And the complete opposite happened. Every 
year that I was not practicing and, and my my firm had a script where we answered the phone. We were told that I wasn't accepting cases right now, but we can set you up with one of our senior attorneys and they'd be in great hands. And they'd had the whole, you know, the script. No one gave them a hard time. Mm. And they, we still got retained and our business continued year after year just to increase in revenue and growth. So so let me back up a step if I could interrupt you. So, Mm -hmm. okay. So one thing you said is you changed the name happy even after, because this was your divorce attorney, which is very cute. Um, And then first of all, you got some pushback, like some of the old timers didn't like it. And I just want to recognize that because it doesn't sound like you cared because some people and many women, in fact, like we have, Oh, some people don't like this. And then we get all in our heads. And what if it's not going to work? And luckily you had enough under your belt where you said the phone was still ringing that you had that, um, you know, that I guess, uh, feedback, right. That says like, Oh no, it's okay. But it's very possible with ups and downs of business. I can't imagine it was always easy, but that you didn't have that feedback. And like you had to hold, like one of my friends, who uh, Jennifer Hootie, she talks about hold the vision, not the circumstance. And it's this vision of, okay, here's the firm. And then eventually, you know, I'm taking myself out and this is the vision of it. And this is what I want. And there's going to be opposition, but I'm going to hold to it no matter what. So when, when, during the times where there was like still, I, I mean, I can't imagine you weren't doing anything to make the phones ring. And cause it usually doesn't happen that way. But when, what were the times or or when were the times that you had the opposition, but you stuck with it anyway, knowing that like, this is your path. I have to stick to my guns and not veer from it because I'm sure that came up. Um, you know, I think it always comes up with any, any change. Um, it's, it's come up when I've restructured the firm and just changed how we worked internally. Um, there was some op- internal opposition with that. Uh, certainly when I changed the name and, and for, for that one in particular, um, the way I looked at it was, of course, when someone said something like that, because we heard the comments a few times, it made me pause for a second and question. But then I realized I want to attract one particular type of client. And it's the type That's of client- who, right. And it was the type of client who was really not looking to, uh, fight and they were looking for, uh, to really get through their divorce in a peaceful way, in a mindful way. And those were the type of clients I I wanted to attract. And those are the ones that, that we do attract. So yes, it was definitely uh, keeping the vision. I've always been someone who's trusted my intuition, um, and that initial gut, I always go back to that feeling everyone, when my head starts to get a little too chattery and I start to question myself, I always go back and it was like, wait a second, what was that initial thought that I had and why? And, um, but that takes, that takes some awareness to do that because you definitely, as a business owner, you can start to doubt yourself. Um, did you, did you, how did you learn that? I mean, I spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on masterminds and coaches and business, business events and seminars and all that, because I just, I didn't intuitively know that stuff. Like I need to constantly reinforce that I just hired a new coach because I'm like, Oh yeah, I can't do this by myself. Not that I can't, I shouldn't say that we usually do pushups in our family. If we say the word can't, but I have a, I have a challenge with sticking to my gun and like believing in myself and, and holding that vision when I don't have someone saying, yeah, hold the vision. Like you got this. Right. And if I have that person or I have that community, then I can do it. But without it, I really struggle. Did you have something supporting you or did, were you just like naturally confident? (laughs) It's funny. I'm not, no, I'm definitely not that. Um, but I'm almost the opposite. So I did all the things too, the masterminds and the coaches and all that, but I use that more for the strategy side of it. Like the the head side of it, I had a good grasp on, but it was like, okay, now help me with strategy, help me with like looking at the numbers and figuring out how to scale and how to make that leap. And like, for me, that was the scariest thing is making the leap, like knowing I wanted to scale to get, to get to that seven figures and then get over that and figure out how to get there. And those were big decisions that may Mm. kept me up at night. Like that stuff, I was where I needed the coaching because it felt so scary to me. And it was like, how are we going to make overhead? What if we don't have the clients that come in to cover that? Um, The vision part of it was, was easier because I knew, and I had gone through a divorce myself. I had 
um, a young child at the time who's now 17. And I knew the experience that I went through for my divorce and what I wanted other people to, to experience with, with co-parenting. And I knew, you know, I, I knew that feeling of what the shame that was surrounded with divorce. So I knew if I just kept tapping back into, I can help people do this and I can help them do it in a different way than what you see on TV and other people's experiences. And Mm -hmm. if I just continued to make the practice conducive to that and have that experience, then people would come in because that's what they would, the right people would be drawn to that. Yeah, that's Um, awesome. Mm -hmm. And it's always, it was always about that. So that part was easier for me. It was the scaling that was way harder. So what were some of the things that you did specifically that you might've learned from these masterminds or coaches were to, in order to scale and besides maybe changing the names and what you mentioned already? Um, so I was at a, a threshold where we were earning high six figures and I could not break that. Hmm. And it was like, a, what? it was crazy because I, at that point I was practicing in the business and I'm like, I just want to get to that mark. How do we get there? And um, the coaching that I received was, um, hire more people, hire faster. And it was in, in my mind, it was like, I'll bring on another lawyer in a year and then we'll bring on another staff member, you know, after that. And she, you know, this particular coach was like, why are you waiting? Bring that person on now, bring the extra staff on now. And then once you stop taking the cases and you manage them, then their productivity increases. And I was looking at it like I have to do the work because I build the Mm -hmm. highest and I'm going to generate the most revenue. And I was the hindrance in the practice. And once I pulled myself, right? You you wouldn't think like you think like, no, I'm the one. Um, But I was actually the one holding back. And so I got called out a little bit on that. And it was like, you need to let go of some of that control. So that was my major call out. And um, and And was it hiring another attorney or was it more... Uh, admin stuff. Yeah, so it was so. bringing we we expanded our our support staff, uh brought on another lawyer. I stepped back and then I restructured just how the our billing structure works and our numbers and got really really clear and started, you know, you'd appreciate this is from a financial perspective of like I, for years I just I I looked at things and but I didn't really like assess them. I really didn't like plan yeah. based on it. Um and I took the time at that point every single month to sit with my numbers, to print the reports, to look at projections, figure out where we fell short the month before, see how we could generate more income like really spent time on the growth side of it. Yeah. And as much as you say, like, duh, we would know that because we're like the financial world here. I I think that's actually totally lacking in the financial advisory space. Like, yeah, financial advisors are really great about, you know, looking at retirement numbers for their clients, but it's kind of just like therapists need therapists. You know, it's like, um, yeah, you're good at it helping others, but usually when it comes to the business numbers, most advisors aren't great at it. Um, that's what I found at least. And it's like, you know, even saying KPIs are like, what, what does that mean? Yeah. KPIs. <laughs> if you don't know the word KPI is like, no offense. If you're listening to this, I'm not, I'm not making you feel bad. You know, here to make you feel bad, but it's like to look at the numbers and make decisions on that is, is the most important thing. And the coach that I just hired, he even, you know, to me where I thought I was, I, didn't, I wouldn't say it was hundred percent clear my numbers, but I'm looking at my numbers knowing that I need to understand my numbers in order to make decisions, but still not having total clarity just because there's so much complex, you know, complexity in my business where I'm like, I I still don't know. And he's like, we have to simplify this and we have to get clear on this. And, um, you know, going back to, you were saying a, a high six figures going to the seven figure mark and hiring people. I think it's like, it's a total dance. You know, it's, we actually, we, my tendency was to just, and I didn't hire like other coaches so much. Uh, it was more like we hire marketing people or we hiring, mm-hmm. you know, um, admin or we are hiring people within like internal staff to like help with the other stuff. Um, but what we found is, you know, we were at a point where now our, you know, just our burn weight rate was $75,000 a month. And you're like, shit, it's great to have a seven figure business, but then you're like, okay, now my burn rate is $75,000 a month. And we were relying a lot on Facebook ads. And it's like, okay, it's at a point where this is, this is too much stress. And I kind of went the opposite route of like, okay, I'm going to actually cut, like, I look at my numbers going like, how can I do this? You know, with less, 
focus on just because I already, you know, was already at seven figures, but like less focus on just the, the, the top line revenue and more focus on the bottom line revenue, which is, you know, my book, you see in the background, it's like make more money, help more people. So I'm always like, okay, must grow top line revenue because that means I'm helping more people. But realize like when I'm stressed about money, just like anyone, I'm not helping more people. And so I'm like, okay, we got to, you know, back up the truck. This happened this year where we're like, we started to lay off some people. We're like, okay, we just got to, what do we really need? And then go back to like simplifying the business. I remember one of my coaches, we actually did a, uh, did a podcast with him. You can look back. Um, his name is Alex Sharfin. I'll try to find the, the, the episode number in a second, but, um, he's, he has a podcast also called momentum. He's great, but he was saying like the more complicated your business is the less money you're going to make. And we got to a point in our business where it was just too complicated, you know, it's just, and it's probably not even that complicated, but just, too many things, you know, flying in too many different directions, always running and launching a new event or, or the same event and, and just like so much complexity. And so now we're like slowing down, you know, lowering expenses, you know, still on track, but like not, we're just trying not to run anymore. You know? Yeah. So- I, you know, I got to that point to uh, this year actually. And I was at this sort of crossroads where I was like, all right, we're either going to go all in and grow this business bigger and open up satellite offices and and increase our staff. And then I sat back and I was like, but for what, for what, you know, okay, I'm going to increase all of this overhead. What does it actually change in terms of what, you know, my income or the, but like, what does that change? I'm like, it does, it may not change much or it may change so little that I didn't, I decided I didn't want to do it. And the opportunity to sell came in and I'm like, that's, that's the next move. Um, so I can move on, but so it was how, that. Yeah. Yep. I was going to say, how did that opportunity come in? I'm sorry to cut you off. You're going to finish your thought first. Yeah, no, it was, um, I had, that was, it was always kind of a five-year plan for me, um, where I was like, well, at that point, my son will be out of college and, um, I five years from losing- now. From it five was. years from now. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but the, in the back of my mind, I'd always been like, I really wish, like, I really wish I could do it now. I really wish I, but there was, I was always like, but I can't, it's, you know, it's my steady job and it's my income source and all of the, the reasons oh, I was talking myself out of. And then a person who I actually thought would be a good fit to buy it, um, reached out to me and was like, Hey, I know you're not practicing anymore. Or you went, you know, you let's have a conversation. And at that point, I was like, you know what? If that is not a sign from the universe that it's go time, you know, it, and it was. And so we put the the things into, you know, we're we're wow. like knee deep in all of the process now. So we yeah, put things wow. into motion. So um, hopefully, it all works and is out this fine. But the attorney that's buying it practicing, yeah, yeah, practicing stuff. Uh, he has he has another firm. Okay. But he's still practicing. He's not just running yeah. the business. Okay. Uh, he may be stepping back and just doing more Got of the it. running okay. now. Yeah. Okay. But he's younger and he still has, you know, fire in his belly. But you, this is what you keep saying, like, you know, oh, 17 years or, you know, you've been in business, 17 year old child. And like, you look like you're 25. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the Zoom filter. <laughs> you, you did you did say we could talk about skincare yeah. <laughs> before we started recording. So maybe we should, but um. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious. I, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of people come up against this is like, what's next. So, you know, how, uh, what is next for you? And you are, I mean, I don't know how old you are, but you're clearly like a lot younger than it sounds based on your experience. So maybe you can tell us if you don't yeah, want to keep yeah. them all hanging, but, um, <laughs> got to be in your forties, right? Yeah. 46. Okay. So, so yeah, me too. So we're young spring chickens here, but like, what's next? Like, are you going to buy a a business? Are you going to chill out? Are you on the beach? Like what the heck do you do? Because I I think a lot of people don't want to sell the business because they feel like they lose their identity and not just like practicing, but not just the income. Cause if you get, and you have a nice sellable business, you can like sit tight for a while, but yeah. How do you feel about that emotionally? Um, It's funny because when this all started, I had this like emotional reaction. It was just like, is this, am I actually going to do this? It was like my baby. It's something that you built up. And then I stepped back and realized I did want to do other things. And the firm was actually tying me down from doing those things. So I, when my son goes off to college in a year, I wanted to go somewhere and live a different season in, in somewhere, another state. And if I was still in the firm, I wouldn't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. 
but that alone wouldn't have been the reason. Um, in the meantime, while I was still over the past few years, while I was still running this, I actually launched a tech company, um, Hmm. For tarot card readers. In your spare time, just launched a tech company for tarot card readers. Okay. (laughs) Totally random, right? Yeah. People are like, what? But it's been, I've been behind the scenes building that, which is really fun because I'm Mm -hmm. not required to, I have a a co-founder who is the face of it and I don't have to be the face. I just do all of the marketing. Um, But I also have, I'm a writer. So I have a book coming out next month. I have other books uh, in the tank ready to be written and finished. And um, I started speaking. So I really wanted to kind of hone that craft of uh, speaking. And then of course I, I have two other business plans in my, the back of my brain that I said, once this happens, then I'll sit down. I love, I would love like a season of not working. Right. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think I could ever not work, but not really doing the, the regular hustle. Like, like a weekend, of- like a weekend. Yeah. Season? Like a week- <laughs> yeah right. Like, like, I feel hours. like, I feel like it's like, we, you know, I, I, was, I, I think about that. I fantasize about this sometimes too. It's like, yeah. because it, I don't think I'd ever stop, but it's like, I like not having the pressure of yeah. feeling like I have to, you know, earn or I have to like keep this going. And I, I definitely, you know, am not in a position where I could sell the business by any stretch, you know, definitely too reliant on me at this stage. Um, but I, I fantasize about that, like, cause it's not like I want to stop. It's just, yeah. uh, you know, more of a focus in a different direction, like similar, mm-hmm. you know, maybe speaking, maybe it's more like if I didn't have to focus on getting clients, like, okay, I could, you know, write my next, you know, three books or something, but, um, yeah. Yeah. So I love that. I love that. I think, you know, most entrepreneurs, like it's never over, especially at 46, like it, it doesn't end that way. But, um, I want to, I want to just give them, because I mentioned this podcast and I think this guy is great, Alex Sharfin. Um, if you go back to September, 2022, it's episode 88, how we entrepreneurs are changing the world with Alex Sharfin. Um, so good. It's so good and very inspiring. And, and basically, you know, he's all about telling you the entrepreneur, like how you're changing the world. And it's really great. Um, so check that out. And if I'm doing some weird thing and who knows by the time this podcast comes out, but I'm doing a weird thing that is speaking of like the opposite of like toning down, I started taking, like getting on calls again. And I have this new strategy where it's all about pulling money at like existing, uh, excuse me, like pulling business or AUM out of your existing clients or from your existing book of business. And it's most people, like most advisors are doing these portfolio reviews. I don't know if they do anything like this with uh, an attorney work, but like they're doing portfolio reviews, meeting with clients. They don't really know how to do it in a way that actually finds more money. And it's not the intention to find more money, but it's just the intention is that they probably need your need help. And the way that you're doing a portfolio review isn't really conducive to getting another appointment or getting more AUM from that. So if you're at all curious about that idea, you have a book of business, you're doing portfolio reviews anyway, and you want to be more effective and more efficient with it, send an email to support at robincrane.com uh, and just put uh, portfolio reviews in the subject line. And if at that stage, if I have a whole, I'm, I'm putting together a whole new system for it. Like I can send you the system or maybe we'll just jump on a call and I'll customize it to you. So put it in there and uh, we'll hook you up. I recently had someone, uh, I said, I give, I give away some free, oh, you have your, your book's not coming out yet, but you have an, another book. Do you have a, another book? Um, I have my books coming out in, on September 5th. So very okay. soon. So, and by the time we launch this, it might be already after that. Um, what's it called again? She who wins. Okay. And what's it about? So it is about how to, it's, obviously for a woman, how to ditch your inner good girl, overcome uncertainty and win at your life, where I teach a framework on how to tap into what you really want, drop all of those excuses and take strategic action. Okay. So I'm going to do something I did before that. I, I I was just testing, but I had someone else who had a book and I was like, okay, the first five people who message me will, I'll, I will buy the book. I will buy your book. Um, and I will send it to you. So I will buy Renee's book and I'll send it to you. And just, uh, again, probably the best way is support at robincrane.com. Just say, send me the book, she who wins, and I will send it to you. And I did the last time I did five, but then there were some people who still wanted it after five. And so I'm going to do 10 this time. So if you're hearing this, even if it's a month after and you just sometimes people don't take action, you want the book, I will send you a copy on my dime. Then you can, uh, you can win. You can be the woman who wins. Um, so awesome. any, anything else to add and, and tell them where to find you, Renee? 
Oh, so um, Instagram is is kind of the place that I hang out, which they can find me over at Ms. Renee Bauer. And um, if you're listening, drop in, she say hello, tell me that you came from Robin's podcast. And um, I answer all of my DMs and I'm always in there. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. And you can DM me too every once in a while. No one DMs me or maybe I'm just bad at checking, but you know, send me a message <laughs> on LinkedIn, DM me, like tell me you actually listen to this podcast because I know we have like you know, lots of listeners, but I don't know you. So I'd love I to know. Right. Sometimes it sounds like you're talking to <laughs> nobody. I mean, I'm and cool. Just will be like, have the conversation. Then, then you'll hear it. someone will be like, I listened to that episode, you know, three months ago. And you're like, right. Oh, there's someone out there. <laughs> yeah. It is nice. We like to hear from you. I know you're out yeah. there, but tell me, tell me, tell me. It'd be nice to know. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Renee. And thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time on growing your financial business, the woman's way. Bye-bye.